Okay. Uh, well, as Phil said, I'm uh, Jerry Truex. I have a PhD from Durham University, and the focus of my studies was really on early Judaism and Christianity, and I did my doctoral dissertation on the Gospel of John. Uh, I turned it into a book. It's called The Problem of Blasphemy, Blasphemy Early Jewish Understandings and the Gospel of John, and the Fourth Gospel, sorry. I've taught at uh, Bethel College, uh, Tabor College, Durham University, Institute of Christian Studies, and uh, I have a Master of Divinity. I have a bachelor's degree in biblical studies, bachelor's degree in psychology, and then I was working on one in philosophy that didn't quite finish it. So I'm just a, I used to be a library rat, uh, and, but now does anybody use the library? Okay, so that's who I am. Now tonight I'd like to talk to you about the temple of our soul and the Lord's Prayer. Uh, I tell you about before, it's about 30 minutes. So I hope I can move through it. You do, have, if you don't want to take notes, uh, you have all of my notes right there, and you can re review them later on. So just, you know, uh, take this as you want. Now I have to make one more uh, disclosure. I'm a diabetic, and my blood sugar dropped too low just moments before we got online. So I had to eat a bunch of apples, and it's now back up to 86. So I've got to monitor that, and you may see me eating apple slices. So I don't know how that will work out. All right, uh, let's move ahead then. Uh, tonight we're going to look at uh, the Jerusalem temple, or imagery of the Jerusalem temple, during the time of Jesus. Second, we're going to look at the temple as the axis mundi, or the axis of the world. Third, let's see if I can get, I got a lot going on here. Third, uh, we're going to look at the early Christian claim that they themselves were the living temple. Fourth, we're going to look at the Qumran community's worship as an ascent to the heavenly temple. And fifth, we're going to look at the Lord's Prayer as the connection point between heaven and earth. And we'll just look at the first three or so petitions, so we won't do the whole thing. Now, this is the uh, Jewish temple in the time of Jesus. It's the second temple. Uh, it was constructed around 515 after the return from exile, and it was destroyed in 70 AD by Titus, a uh, Roman general. The temple was considered to be the house of prayer for all people. It was the place and the presence of God, Yahweh, the king of the universe. And it was the consummate place for prayer on planet Earth. It was the center of the universe, or thought to be, the axis mundi, the connection point between heaven and earth. Now sitting in that very spot is the Al-Aqsas Mosque. It was built sometime between 705 and 1035 uh, CE. And over here, if you can see my mouse wiggling, right down over here is the Wailing Wall. We can't see the... Uh, the um, uh, the blocks down there, but that's where part of Herod's temple still exists, and that would be the temple of Jesus. Now we're going to move on to a very brief video, about two, less than two minutes, introducing the temple. Oh, I have to make sure that the sound is on, so let me check that. Share sound. Okay. Can you hear that, Phil? The dimensions of the Temple Mount are mind-boggling. The western wall that we know is just a small part of a huge wall 500 meters long. To give you an idea, the total area of the Temple Mount is 144,000 square meters, equal to the area of 30 soccer fields. The stairs were designed with treads of varying sizes, forcing the pilgrims to a relaxed, dignified pace as they ascended to the holy place. When they emerged at the Temple Mount Plaza, the pilgrims saw an astonishing sight. The huge plaza. The 
Stoa. The courts. The ornate gates. At the top of the hill, towering to the heavens, rose the temple building itself. Wide in front and narrow in back, the temple reminded the ancients of a seated lion, his mane facing forward. A grapevine made of sparkling gold leaf curved upward from the entrance to the temple building. Golden adornments shone on the roof as on a royal crown. Before them rose one of the largest, most magnificent houses of prayer in the entire world. Even Titus, who destroyed the temple, declared it the glory of human creation. Whoever has not seen Herod's building has never seen a beautiful building in their life. Tens of thousands of pilgrims, Jews and non-Jews alike, thronged the new temple to worship the God of Israel. They came from around the world to see the biggest sacred compound ever built. A temple built for an invisible God with no images or idols. Its gates open to everyone. A house of prayer for all nations. Okay, so uh, I wanted to show that video because it shows the immensity of the temple. It was one of the seven wonders of the world. And the temple sat on a piece of real estate that is larger than where the three pyramids sit in Egypt. So truly immense. Now let's take a look at the temple and Jewish spiritual life. The first thing I want to look at is the temple as the axis mundi of the cosmos. So here we have a depiction first of the cosmos based on Genesis 1 and the six days of creation with each day contributing various elements of this model. Now you can find uh, various pictures of ancient Jewish cosmology online if you want, but this, this is one of them. In ancient cosmology, the temple, which has correlations with the Garden of Eden, the Tree of Life, and Adam serving as a priest in Genesis 2, verse 15, formed that axis mundi, which is Latin for uh, the axis of the world. So the axis mundi refers to the pillar or the tree on which the world rotates. It's the center of the universe, the link between heaven and hell, or heaven and earth, or so it was thought. In this model, the earthly temple was the axis point to the heavenly temple, as explained in Exodus 25. And it was inextricably bound with the symbol of Israel as a vine planted on Mount Zion in Exodus 15. So the temple was thought to be uh, to be built on Mount Zion. Some people think it's Mount Moriah. It's debated, but I'll, I'll go with Mount Zion at the moment. And so the temple sat on that mountain and it held the universe together. In the ancient world, Jewish spiritual life centered in one place. And if you wanted to meet God, you went to that one place, the Jerusalem temple. In Jewish literature, the earthly temple was a shadow of the heavenly temple. Now, the centrality of the temple is attested by various religious festivals. And here you can see the, uh, the geometry here. You have heaven here and earth here, the temple in between. And we have the axis mundi going from heaven to earth. There is the temple. So now the temple became the center for Jewish life. Of the 613 commandments given to Moses, or so Maimonides tells us, uh, over 200 of them dealt with uh, the rules in the, in the temple. In addition to that, the early Jews had many festivals that centered on the, the temple itself. So, for example, Passover, Tabernacles, or Sukkot, Hanukkah, Purim, the Day of Atonement, and so forth. People from all, all around Judea and as far up as Galilee and, and sometimes from other nations would gather in Jerusalem during these great festivals. Philo tells us and Josephus tell us that somewhere between 100 and 150,000 people would show up for these great festivals. So I think of them as great religious parties or ancient rock concerts. But that's how important this temple was. The place in the presence of God and the center of national identity and unity. 
Now, let's take a look at the Yeshua affair. There was a certain Jewish fellow who came along and said that the temple would be destroyed. It was Yeshua. During one Passover, Yeshua came to the temple, and a large Jewish crowd greeted him and proclaimed to be the Messiah, or Israel's king. He approached the temple, and he saw a fig tree, and he said, May no one eat of the uh, the fruit of you again. This is uh, Mark 11, uh, 13 and, and 14. Why? Because he said the tree had failed to produce fruit. Then Yeshua and his entourage entered the temple compound, and he was dismayed at the corruption and misuse of the temple. Yeshua saw the temple was a failure, and this is Mark 11, 11 through 19. Well, why was it a failure? Because it failed as the house of prayer for all people. And then Jesus said this. He said, is it not written, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations or all Gentiles or all people? But you have made it a den of robbers. So when they left the temple, Yeshua's disciples noticed that the fig tree had died and disintegrated. And then Jesus predicted that the temple would be destroyed in Mark 11, 22 to 23. And in Mark 13, Jesus and, their, uh, and his disciples are sitting across from the temple in the Mount of Olives. And he predicts that no stone will be left one upon the other, but all will be destroyed. Okay, so what happens? Well, religious leaders are very upset. They take Jesus. They question him. You know the story. They accuse him of blasphemy because they think he's going to threaten. To, they think he's going to destroy the temple. So they accuse him of blasphemy. They hand him over to Pilate. Pilate says, well, who is this guy? Well, and they say, he, he's pretending to be the Jewish king. And of course, Pilate, representative of the of the Roman Imperium says, well, this can't be. This guy's an insurrectionist. We're going to kill him for this. And we know Jesus was tortured and killed and executed in 30 AD, and the temple still stood. And yet 30 years later, Titus rolls in during the Jewish-Roman War from 66 to 73, and he destroys the temple. Not one stone was left upon another, except the Wailing Wall. What do we make of that? So, without a temple. Without a temple, Jewish religious life was turned upside down. How could they pray and where? Where could they bring their offerings? How were they to celebrate the great festivals? In what place could people receive forgiveness or atonement? Now, the Jewish messianic movement, namely the Jesus movement, had their response. Essentially, they said, we don't need a temple because we are the living temple, the risen body of Christ. They remembered that when Jesus was walking through the region of Samaria one time, which is the central region of Palestine, he stopped to get water at a well near the city of Sychar. Uh, it's also known as Shechem, and today it's, it's Nablus. Sychar was the city at the base of Mount Gerizim, and Mount Gerizim was the mountain where the Samaritans had their temple. Uh, Heraclius destroyed that temple in about 124 BCE, but that was where their temple was. And Mount Zion is where the Jews or Judeans had their temple. And so the woman asked Jesus, well, where should we worship? And Jesus tells her, he says, well, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain, probably pointing to Mount Gerizim, nor in Jerusalem, Mount Zion. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father seeks such as these to worship him. So for Jesus, the temple buildings sitting atop mountains don't really matter. What matters is worshiping in spirit and truth, which is like saying, I think, let your temple be your own soul. The temple is within you. And the apostle Paul agrees with him. Paul says, do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? So early Christians realized that they themselves were the place in the presence of God on earth. God dwelled within them. They were the living earthly temple. So this means that the followers of Jesus discovered that when they prayed, they were the axis mundi of the universe. They were the connection point between heaven and earth. They were the living stones of a spiritual house of worship, 
as 1 Peter 2.5 tells us. So if we no longer find God in the Jerusalem temple, we must find God within us. And that, I believe, is what the Lord's prayer reveals. The Lord's prayer gives us a pattern for being the living temple on planet Earth. Now I want to look at the Qumran community. During the time of Jesus, there were a group of people that lived out near the Dead Sea in the north, uh, northwestern corner uh, at a place called Qumran. Most scholars think it was probably the Essenes that were there. Anyway, they formed a community there, roughly 150 to 200, although estimates are debated. Uh, and they are the ones that wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls. It's about 14 miles from, from Jerusalem. The Essenes had rejected the Jerusalem temple because they thought it was corrupt. Uh, so they went into the Judean desert to live and to worship as an alternative community over against mainstream Judaism in the, centered in the temple in Jerusalem. So these are the ones, as I mentioned, who wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls. The Dead Sea Scrolls, which were discovered in 1945, they discovered about uh, 15,000 fragments now we know. And out of that, they've developed, they have put them back together and have somewhere between 800 and 900 manuscripts. One of the manuscripts they wrote was called The Songs of the Sabbath Sacrifice or the Angelic Liturgy. It's composed of 13 songs sung by the Qumran community on 13 consecutive, consecutive Sabbaths. So when we read the angelic liturgy, we find that the Essenes believe that their community, not a building, was the earthly temple, like the early Jesus movement. Now, their worship enabled them to have visionary experiences. When we read that document, in the liturgy, the Qumran community calls on the priestly angels in the heavenly temple to join them in worshiping God. And the angels join them in praying and chanting and singing. And the liturgy attests to them having visionary experiences of the heavenly temple. And it includes a visionary experience of the glory of God sitting on the throne. And that throne is a chariot in Hebrew, Merkaba. So this is the beginning or one of the elements of what is called Merkaba mysticism in the Jewish tradition, going from Ezekiel, where we first learn about the Merkaba, uh, the Merkaba throne, uh, Ezekiel 1, clear up through the Zohar and uh, the Hasids and so forth. So this encompasses a broad stream of Jewish mysticism. Now, in the 13th and 14th song of this, the Song of Sabbath Sacrifices, the worshipers invite the divine glory to indwell them as the living temple. So this is uh, this is about a 60 second video of Qumran on the Dead Sea. So here we're moving into toward Qumran. You see all the caves there. This is the Qumran community. We can see this is a mikvah. Oh no, that's yeah. Uh, I'll point out a few things if I can. There's the center tower. This is a mikvah, a ritual bath. There are about eight of them there. So purity was a big, important thing for them. These are the caves where the Dead Sea Scrolls were hidden. This is cave four right here. This is cave four right here. Very important cave because a lot of scrolls were found here. And that's cave four. And you come along here and you drop down through the hole there to go in. So these are the Dead Seas. Uh, these are the caves of the Dead Sea. And this is where the Qumran community lived. Uh, there were, uh, there was a refractory, there was a scriptorium, there were storage units, they produced some things, they had, they, there was an ample community here. And you can see that uh, the sea, the Dead Sea is off to the, the right of this video. So now let us turn to the Lord's Prayer. And look at the structure that picks up on the theme of heaven and earth, 
that co-locate that co-locates in human prayer and experience. So here it is. Uh, we heard it sung recently. I think most of us have memorized and said it off and on all throughout our life. You'll notice that it parallels the temple as the axis mundi of the universe. Our Father, let your name be hallowed, let your will be done, let your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. And then give us, then we have the remaining petitions and then the doxology. The Lord's Prayer turns on the phrase, on earth as it is in heaven. It suggests that the Lord's Prayer, or prayer in general, really, is a connection point between heaven and earth. As Jesus presents it, heaven and earth are connected in acts of prayer. For Jesus, Jesus prayer is the place of God's presence on earth, as exemplified by the Qumran community's angelic liturgy. So the early Jesus movement, John the Baptist, Jesus, the Qumran community, were all worshipers in the Jewish tradition. And I think there was some cross-pollination going on here. John the Baptist may actually have been a, a member of the Qumran community. When Jesus was baptized, it was at Jericho, only seven miles north of the Qumran community. So in any case, they saw themselves as the temple on planet Earth. And prayer is the way to realize this. Prayer becomes the axis mundi, the place where we bring heaven and earth together, where the living temple and the heavenly temple harmonize. Now, let us look briefly at the Lord's Prayer. Uh, there are seven petitions, and we'll look just simply at a few of them. First is the Our Father, and this is Avinu in Hebrew. The Lord's prayer, be prayer begins with our Father who is in heaven, and with these words we open our mind and heart to become the temple of our soul, the living temple on earth. So when we pray our Father, I think we are doing several things. We are inviting an I-Thou relationship. In addressing God as Father, we are inviting ultimate reality of the universe to engage us as a Thou, as a You, not as an impersonal It. By speaking Father, we invite ultimate reality to assent to our invitation for an I-Thou relationship. When we say our Father, we are imitating Jesus. Jesus called God Abba, which is Aramaic for Papa or Father. Third, we are expressing our trust in our divine parent. When we call God Father, the implication is that we are God's children and that we trust God in this, with the same kind of trust we trust our parents with. Number four, I think when we say our Father, we are confessing our identity as children of God. Now, take this in consideration. In our world, identity politics is, is an issue. What is our primary identity? Well, this prayer says our primary identity is children of God. When we call God our Father, we are expressing our identity as children of God. We affirm that we are sons and daughters of the Most High when we say, Father. We accept and confess our identity, our role, and our task as children of God. The next thing is that I think when we say our Father, we are pledging to live up to the family name. When we say our Father, we are agreeing to bear the name of God as our name, and we're pledging to behave as sons and daughters of God. Jesus is saying that if we want to be the living temple on earth, if we want to worship God in spirit and truth, if we want to participate as the axis mundi of the cosmic spiritual life, the place to begin is by addressing God as father or mother. So that brings the next issue, God as mother. When we call God, or the question is, can we call God mother or father or parent, and or can we use some other non-human impersonal terms like spirit, creator, ground of being, ultimate concern, or great one? Well, I think, yes, we can. The Bible never calls God mother, never gives God the title of mother, but the Bible certainly authorizes us to think of God as our divine mother. So, for example, here in Isaiah, we have uh, Isaiah saying, thus says the Lord, 
as a mother comforts Rockham, her child, so I will comfort you. Now, this is important because God's compassion is Rockham, and as compared to a mother's womb, Rockham, the words compassion and womb are derived from the same Hebrew word consonants, Resh, Chet, and Mem. And there are other passages in the Old Testament which talk about God as being motherly. So, can we use feminine language for God? Well, I think, of course, and I think we should. The Bible uses a variety of metaphors, including father and mother, to express the character and the action of God. And so, I think we should use God talk with both male and female pronouns and imagery. Now, let's move to the, the next petition. Uh, look, let your name be hallowed. The first petition is, let your name be hallowed. The word hallowed is a translation of the a Greek word agiasteto, which means to make holy, to sanctify, to dedicate, to honor, to revere, to venerate. The name refers to the sacred name of Yahweh, uh, which occurs 6,828 times in the Hebrew Bible. The English translations have L-O-R-D in capital letters. So whenever you see L-O-R-D in capital letters, in the English Bible. Behind that is the name Yahweh. Now, there's only one Bible I know that actually translates this as Yahweh, and that is the Jerusalem Bible of 1967. Um, other than that, you don't find it. Uh, and the Jehovah's Witnesses do reinsert it in the New Testament, but in, but in faulty places. So, in any case, Yahweh is the tetragrammaton, if you, and we read from right to left. So it's Yoheh Vav He. That's the divine name. Now, when Jews read the Hebrew text and see the sacred name, they say Adonai or they say Hashem, because for them, they don't want a mistake in mispronouncing it or desecrating in any way. Uh, they're extremely careful in that regard. Now, notice that the name is not something we discover. Rather, the divine name was given to Moses. Moses couldn't discover the divine name by looking at the burning bush, and we can't discover the divine name by looking at a sunset. The divine name is given to us. It's a gift for us. God reveals him or herself to us as human beings. Revealing the name seems to indicate that God wants a relationship. You don't reveal your name to somebody you don't want to have a relationship with. You kind of hide it, as you do in social media, but God didn't hide God's name. God gave it to human beings. So the first petition is a restatement of the third commandment, do not misuse God's name. The central concern of the third commandment is to protect Yahweh's reputation, to protect the divine name from being dishonored, ridiculed, or made meaningless or vain or empty. Now I want to look at the next petition. Let your kingdom come. In the second petition, we affirm our desire for God's reign or God's will to be realized on earth. We ask that heaven might be manifest on earth. We know that there is a stark contrast between the values and the practices of this world, don't we? And the values and the utopian kingdom of God, there is a sharp contrast between this world and the reign of God. And so when we pray, let your kingdom come, we're praying that heaven comes to earth. And so we are asking God to rain down heaven on earth, really in seven different ways. And I get this from Isaiah. So this defines what the kingdom of God is. When we, when we pray, let your kingdom come, we are saying, rain down the divine spirit and light, Isaiah 60. Rain down deliverance and salvation, Isaiah 43. Rain down peace, Isaiah 11. Rain down healing, Isaiah 35. Rain down our return from exile, Isaiah 35. Rain down righteousness, Zedek, and justice, Mishpat, Isaiah 42. And rain down joy, Isaiah 35. So if someone asks you, what is the kingdom of God? Uh, well, the standard answer is Jesus never defined the kingdom of God, but Isaiah did. And there it is. So these seven characteristics of the kingdom have dawned in the ministry of Jesus 
in this age and will reach fulfillment in the age to come. So let's move to the next. Uh, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The third petition, we dedicate ourselves to enacting and manifesting God's will in bringing some bit of heaven to earth. We can't bring all of heaven to earth, but we can do a little bit. That's what I think. I got this from a Jewish friend of mine 20, 30 years ago, and I forget his name, but I didn't forget what he told me. He said his purpose in life was to bring a little bit of heaven down to this earth every day. And I said, wow, isn't that so Jesus? In any case, the third commission, the third petition, we commit ourselves to transforming ourselves and our world, making God's reign in heaven a here and now reality on earth. When we pray that I will be done, we're affirming our willingness to participate in the kingdom of God, which is dawning here and now in this age. Now, let me just look at the last seven petitions, okay? Give us our daily bread, forgive us of our debts, do not lead us into temptation, deliver us from evil, and then the doxology. The most important thing I was doing here is showing the pattern of the Lord's Prayer, showing you how it fits with our understanding of the temple and how we are the temple of God and how the temple of God resides in us, how God's Spirit dwells in us and we are living temples on this planet Earth. And the purpose of that is to bring heaven to Earth, to connect Earth with heaven, as the Jewish temple did. So I'm not going to go into more detail on the Lord's Prayer. Uh, there are books that you can get. N.T. Wright, The Lord and His Prayer is a good source. By the way, the, Catholic, uh, the Catechism of the Catholic Church uh, goes into some detail on the Lord's Prayer from pages uh, uh, 727 to 57 in my little uh my book, see, I have this thing on my shelf all the time, and I refer to it frequently. It's an, it has an excellent exposition of the Lord's Prayer if you want to go further. So now, finally, I want to just make a couple conclusions. First, the earliest followers of Jesus believed they were living, they were the living temple. They were the connection point between heaven and earth. Their prayers demonstrate that they were the living temple, that God's Spirit dwelled in them. The temple is no longer a physical place, but a state of mind and heart, where we in our prayers ascend to heaven and the divine, and the divine descends to earth. And finally, the Lord's Prayer is a model of such a prayer that manifests the temple of our soul.